друзья, давайте начинать. Dear friends, let's start. We have a very interesting guest after the lunch. I just learned from him that uh, in Belarus, no one person, no person can be a president in any organization because uh, there is only one president in Belarus. So I can want to introduce to you a president of uh, uh, Scientific Research Center, Yaroslav Yaramchuk, uh, who will tell you what Europe does Ukraine need. Thank you very much, my friends. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to see some faces in Ukraine and uh, I really love this country, the country that is in war, protecting its dignity and you need to know where to go and like Kahan, uh, Mr. Larionov, I'm um, really wondering where to go, so I decided to talk to you about where Ukraine uh, is going, and Ukra Ukraine has declared its European vector, and geographical Europe is quite clear, but in terms of specific things. What do you want to go? When you what, what do you mean by saying Europe? Domestification and disaggregation. I know people who uh, specialize in economics. I know the Austrian school of ec economy uh, don't like aggregates. Because if you don't uh, uh, understand what 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 are par integral parts of that concept it will be very hard to to understand uh, so what I will try to say I will try to be more scientific so geography and membership in, in EU doesn't mean uh, common values and institute so let's uh, check this European membership for such thing as a relation to yourself, relation to freedom, relation to other uh, other uh, money and success, and relation uh, attitude to the state and attitude to business. Yeah, well, so I made this subjective table for the types of groups of countries, including different things. And I will prove that these things are different. The first group is Germany, Austria, and Holland. You can continue this group. France, Belgium, Sweden, Denmark, uh, developing countries, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, another way and problematic countries of the European Union, Greece, Spain, and Portugal. And this division, if you look up how citizens of these countries, uh, their relation to themselves and uh, an economy, you will understand that you can't uh, talk about Europe as a single thing. And this is the proof. Uh, start, let's start with the values. The Euro Barometer Agency does lots of uh, research. European 2014, this is how research is called. And the questions are, in your opinion, in terms of shared values, are EU members the same or the different? Let's take France. And in France, 42% think that uh, the European European values are very mostly common, but 29 values, uh, th people think that they are quite different. Sorry, 65% of people in France think that the values in the European Union are different. 65% of French, two-thirds of people think that the values of European Union are different. Can you imagine that? 
So you think that values should unite Europeans, but French people think that this is not the case. While in Germany, 50 percent think that European Union values are homogeneous, but only 50 percent and 65 percent of French think that the values are the same. Let's take two countries that have different history and at the same time countries that, that, that show the uh, diversity of the values in Poland and Sweden. And Swedish think that 43 percent 43 percent of people think that the values are common. Um, Poland, they joined the EU recently and they have this euphoria, so 28 percent they say that they are different for 63 think that the values are the same. If you consider French and the Poles, their attitude towards EU values will be absolutely different. So we see all countries of the EU, the red bars are people who think that they are different, and the blue bars uh, are the people who think that they are the same. Uh, these are values. It's not the opinion of uh, Euro European Parliament, European Commission. This is a value. This is an opinion of Europeans. When we talk about European Union, European values, you have to understand what do you mean, because you can uh, be a part of this skeptics category with France, Latvia, Spain, Cyprus, Luxembourg, or you can be a part of optimists who think that the values are common, Slovakia, Malta, Poland, Croatia, Czech Republic, and you see the, this is a 50-50 point, 50 and 42. So there is no common attitude to European values. When you say about European values, you have to explain what do you mean. Because, because you can see many different values in the European Union. The attitude to the uh, direction of the country development. Let's take a look at the temple. Germany and France, one of the driving forces of the EU. There's a different attitude towards uh, the attitude of the economic situation in the country. And probably part of these people will say that the situation is fine, but there will be skeptics who are very skeptical towards the European values. If you ask Italians, it will be worse. 24 percent were for that in 2002, and now they have less. <coughs> so it's a, Europe is very diverse. There is some stability. Uh, stable popularity of uh, attitudes inside the EU. Uh, Germany becomes more optimistic and Poland becoming more optimistic, plus 12, and France minus 21, Britain minus 22, so it's a Spain minus 51. So what is the situation in the EU? Uh, very different opinions inside the EU. Economical integration, is it good or is it bad? We, uh, see, we hear that the European integration is a very good thing. It sets people free and uh, destroys barriers and what the member states think about that. Uh, 63 percent of Germans think that it's good, 53 percent of Polish, 17 percent of Greeks, uh, 26 percent of French. There's a huge difference between these countries. And the question is if uh, in the EU there is no common opinion is it, of is it good or is it bad. Many Europeans can say, you, where are you going to Ukraine or Belarus? 
<coughs> it's not that good, but you, you need to understand what message you, you, you have and where you want to go. The reaction to a crisis is quite similar to the situation when they blaming blaming other people. The people were asked, do you need to let the immigrants in? You see, the Greeks, 86% think that we need less immigrants. Italy, 80. France, 57. British, 55. This is a reaction to the crisis. As soon as you have less money, and when the state model is less stable, people tend to blame other people, aliens. They are eating our bread. Let's uh, let less immigrants, let's get rid of them. It's just quite um, nasty because it smells like chauvinism. And immigrants are the people to blame uh, when they have this question in pure research are immigrants as an economic burden. 70% of Greeks think that yes, 65% of Italians, yes, 52 for Poland, 52 for uh, France, more than half. When we talk about the freedom of <coughs> movement, we, we need to Happy, be happy about it, but the EU is not ready to create a free labor market. But it, because as soon as the economic economy went down, immigrants were the one to blame. And they are not saying that immigrants make the economy of the country stronger because 66% of Germans believe that, and Greeks and Italians. 90% of uh, Greeks and Italians think that uh, immigrants do not make the country stronger. So this freedom of movement is in the crisis situation. It doesn't work, especially when 25% of young people think that it's a difficult situation when uh, uh, radicalist organizations say that uh, uh, the integration is not necessary. Speaking about federalism, Euro Europeans, uh, Ukrainians became more European when uh, people think the federalism means that the people think that the success is defined by uh, by some external powers out of your control. And just take a look at the table. In Germany, 67% of people think that is out of their control. In Italy, 66, 51 for Japan, 45 for, for Turkey. I think Ukraine has 65% of people think that success is not about uh, your uh, input your labor, but people are looking for any powers out of their control, like lobbyists, uh, connections. This is a value crisis, and you can be trapped with that. The question is, another question is, what is the main reasons of the gap between the rich and the poor in your country today? And this is a, a question to discuss. Why does the, why does that happen? Some people work more. It's a natural explanation why some people have more money, some people have, and other people have less. You see how many people uh, have this opinion in the U.S. and in, in the U.K. These are remains of Anglo-Saxon Saxon culture. And all other countries uh, blame it on the economical policy of the government, a low salary, and they say uh, make the employers 
pay more and this is the redistribution they think that they need to intrude into the relations between the employers and employees people don't see the difference between uh, earned money and the money that uh, lobbyists that get lots of money from the budget, tens of billion uh, dollars, even even when they are ineffective. And uh, the very important message for us is that we can see that their attitude towards values is different, but when you are asked, are you for the free market? And it's still attractive among people. People say, you see how many people think that uh, a free market is better. 57% for Italy, 45% for Spain, 65% for Britain, 70% for USA. And this situation, free market is concept is so vague, so abstract. When people want more nationalization, interventionism, they still think that free market is good. Because when politicians meet and say, I'm support free market, they mean absolutely different things. And you should be aware of that. So you have to uh, explain. This means that Western Europe is sick with protectionism. Uh, what Bastia wrote about, and probably th lots of people say that uh, trade is good. When foreign companies build uh, factories in our country is good, 74% say yes. And trade leads to the decrease in prices, where trade is a great value, great means to create competition. But only 27% support this axiom. And trade leads to the increase of salaries, and only one-fourth of people believe that. And trade is good is one thesis, but this means that Economically and theoretically, the European Union, as Ukrainian, Belarus, and Russia, are economically literate people. They don't understand economic theory, and they are consistent in that. And when say we support free trade, but then they support limitation. This is a series of indi indices that allow you to uh, draw a conclusion. European Union seem to be a single system of institutes doing business in the indices, economical freedom indices, and the leaders and outsiders in this table, you see the difference. Denmark, Greece, Italy, and Hungary are different worlds. Roughly saying, Belarus is better, has better indices than Greece, Italy, and Hungary. And when our leaders ask where she would, where we should go, what Europe do they mean? This Europe or this Europe? We, we say that we don't want to be Denmark, or we, we want to be Denmark. You see, they are, they have great indices. But it's a logical trap. Just pay attention. 55.7% of the GDP is state expenses. If we had this value in Ukraine, just forget about the left columns and consider the last column. We will have the same corruption, oligarchs, the same shit. Nothing will change. And it's very important. Let's take France. We want to be like in France. And Greece, 47 point, 47 and 55. And these are high cost, high cost, high expenditures. 
you can make a system the regulatory and tax system they have when I hear we want to be to live we want to live like in Scandinavian countries I will show you a slide that will give you an idea what I Ukraine wants to look like if you want to be in scan like Scandinavia these are Scandinavian ratings social ratings prosperity index social progress index corruption index Denmark, Britain, Sweden is good. Let's be like Denmark, Britain, and Sweden. We want to be rich. We want to have a high GDP. And Ukraine has around five or six thousand, even less. This rating can be interpreted differently and have conf conclusions that damage Ukraine. And this slide will give you an idea of what state we should build to reach the level of Scandinavian countries. Sweet, let's take Sweden. Many years until 1960, it was a country with the lowest taxes in Europe. Swedish socialism, roughly speaking, was a result of a 60 years of uh, responsible, transparent state. The institutes in Ukraine is are weaker than in, in the middle of the 20th century. Why Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus and many European countries, poor countries, uh, reproduce the model of 2013 is a very rough mistake uh, that you have to consider when uh, creating a development economical program. Consider the USA. The, the US wonder 7.5% of the GDP was the state. 200 people were working for the state. If you want to walk the way of these economical wonder countries, consider this when they were economically weak and unready and our politicians they take take a look at this column and they say we want that these are different values and we talked to Kaha in two, and in 2006 I wrote a book about economical constitution of Belarus and uh, there was an idea behind that uh, <clears throat> restricting the state and limiting the economy, limiting by limiting its costs. 67% of EU countries, 63% of Polish citizens think that the state is too active in, uh, in in uh, messing with the people's lives. But what, who they are voting for, for the existing parties in the parliament, left wing, right wing. Can you give me an example of a party in the European Union that had 10% on the thesis, there's a too much state in our lives. In the US you have Republicans and Democrats, but in terms of the state, they are pretty similar. Yes, something. Some people support the uh, Republicans, and some people support the Democrats. But we are absolutely Europeans in terms of in terms of you cannot eat a cake and have it. The French Leviathan. Yasinik's government consider it, and Poroshenko considers what we should imitate. And they go to Fran France and they say that uh, the state that owns lots of uh, French companies, so the state has to own uh, economy. It's thesis that is very 
all and discredited itself many times and is pushed down the throat in Western countries. And it's a big mistake. And they have uh, different environments. If your energy transport co companies would be in the hands of oligarchs, this is a French way that leads to revolutions from time to time. This is a process with ebolization, brain ebolization process. Ebola, I am a friend of Ebola. Probably uh, are digging in uh, dead bodies and waste. How many people died from Ebola in the world? How many people died from the normal flu? We have to look at the data and not be victim of enormous when Obama says that the Ebola and then Putin is the first threat to uh, the world means that the, the brain is quite embolized. When global warming was a similar thing and people were crazy about everyone, uh, everyone is afraid from the global warming. Now people are afraid from uh, global cooling. Are you aware of the science? And I'm not even talking about threats, but just uh, normal financial uh, literacy. Just take a look at the uh, results. 30% of Americans, 21% of Swedes, 25% of Italians, 27% of Japanese, and 31% of French gave uh, right answers to such simple questions to simple questions on finance. And in Russia, it's only 4% of the people asked provided right answers. A lot of people, huge amount of people do not understand simple things in economy. Who's of your uh, central bank, head of your central bank, Mr. Gondor? If you... If you give this test to, to her, she will probably have poor results. And these politicians who have uh, their PR people and why this informational warfare is effective, because people are not ready to hear these lies. This is a total uh, failure for Kiev. Mohil Academy of Economic School of Ukraine because you have to teach people in schools. You have to teach this people in schools. If people do not pay enough attention to that, just imagine what is happening to more serious things. Lies and lies and oligarchs and oligarchs and people uh, take part in the revolutions. You think that America is a country of uh, capitalism and free society. This is how much uh, taxes and regulation cost to, uh, you, uh, to Americans. Uh, just vice versa, 1.8 regulatory and 3.5 taxes for 2014. Uh, if you make a shift till the the 50s, uh, the indices will be lower. Somebody comes over, a guy from the IMF or World Bank says, I know how to do it, and it works in the United States. Get rid of the guy. Because this person wanted to make the same crap for you at, that cost you 1.3 billion, and where would this money go to? To your regulators and their business partners. Who actually imposed uh, VAT for Ukraine? The most horrible enemy of the Ukrainian economy is VAT. Russian take, Russians take the second place. Because through this tax, you're getting totally corrupt system, which 
sending the way for fair business doing and uh, fair people. Is there any movement against VAT in Ukraine? Because you know you don't know, but you don't know that five or ten percent VAT is an enemy of yours. This is just. Of course, you can you can cooperate and live with it, but when the European Union followed the pace of developing the country, they had very chivalrous goal, which were successfully failed. Competition capacity, the gap between the U.S. and uh, let's say the European Union, EU 15 was. Was well, somewhere here. Those are the United States, and that's the European Union. Back in the past, uh, we made an objective to catch up with the United States and come over it. So we're going, going, going. Seems to be where we are here today. So the gap is still big enough. What's most interesting that following the welfare state pace, we have let those countries go ahead that started from total poverty. South Korea, for instance, started from where it was against the European Union, had a serious gap between, and right now their labor capacity is much higher than in the European Union. However, the distance between the United States is even larger. So if you want to become competitive, and a competitive economy, do not follow the European pace right now because it's the way to nowhere. This is a cul-de-sac situation. You're going to be left behind by other countries. If this is about access to capital, technology, why do you want a system like this? So the question that I'm now asking to myself and yours, what is the theory, the theoretical reasons for the Europeans' sunset? It's not about people changing parties or the thing is about the idea. If you realize the theoretical part of it, of the problems of the European sunset, you're not going to be repeating the same best practice. And what's discouraging me and what's part of the European discourse is Mr. Keynes. That was actually the cover of the November Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, a person, Bloomberg, a tycoon, who said, if you want a rescue economy today, this is the messenger, this is the messiah which, who will come and help you. The messiah says businesses do not want to invest and consumers do not want to spend. So the state has to break down the vicious circle. And now the, the state comes in like in the face of Lukashenko, Putin, Merkel, Lukashenko, Poroshenko, and says, oh, you God damn it, why do you want to spend money? Do spend the money, uh, otherwise I'm going to take it away. How do I take it away? With the help of the tax. You can break down the vicious circle in the pensions. Who's, who's responsible for it? Officials, commercial companies that are too important to fail, financial speculants, taxpayers and tax debtors, tax debtors. There are always people behind who make a lot of money on this. If you think inflation is about losing money, no, inflation makes money. The Grunia falls and they make money on it. Nationalization is made money for people. So who stands behind it? When Europeans offer us different schemes that enrich political entrepreneurs, that is, seems to be very painful for us because I would really want honest business people to benefit from this, but not political speculants. There is another sketch that is just fresh in my mind. A Nobel Prize winner for this year. You know this guy? You've heard of him. So this is so, an economic guru. And look, how, what kind of answer he gave to a simple question that everybody is concerned about. How to solve the unemployment issue in France and Europe as a whole? And the answer is we need to make another tax for large companies in case they fire any staff. Do you like this shit? The question is, that's where the problem is. So in 1991, of course, we realized the Soviet Union collapse and we came over and looked at the IMF and World Bank like, to, like on gods. You gave us wisdom, you gave us freedom. After 25 years, it's high time to turn on your brain and not to actually take any notice of uh, these Nobel Prize winners saying, because it's total fraud. Let's turn to your pure economy and play in the uh, mind games. Mind games. Have you watched the movie? 
the same model, the same movie, the same thing. You just disconnect a person, like one of the Nobel Prize winners said, that is deal, that deals with the theory of expectations. I'm, I'm writing theories for robots, not for people. If you feel yourself robots, then welcome to a different world. This is what's going on with economic theory. So it's very important in this situation to keep in mind where the frontiers are, where the uh, indicators are. In your universities, European, Ukrainian, Belarusian, nobody is saying about this. The most efficient way to fight real opponents is what? Guess what? Excommunication. So the people just don't care. They, they don't know it. In the 10 years' time, I have never known the last names of Rose, Rodberg, Kilsner. These were some some uh, creatures from space for me. It looked, it looked actually Chinese for me. So uh, you just start to realize why, where you're getting into. And it just becomes very painful for the wasted time. And the European this, uh, European things are not have to be repetitive in Ukraine. Unfortunately, all these silly things are getting repetitive in our country, in my country, in yours, and many across many countries in Europe. You could, you could take one trillion uh, investment into boosting the economic growth, Mr. Draghi or disrespected one, whatever you call him, in order to ignite the European economic engine. They said, let's invest one trillion euro into the European economy. Do the same way as Americans did. Who's going to benefit from that? Who's going to be happy? The people who are in the front line at the threshold of the Central European Bank. These are the people whose salaries start at seven or eight zeros um, a year. So this is where the problem is. And we think, okay, this money will help us. Europe can sink. Japan has already been sunk. And this old troubles are going on all around here. This is a typical foreign currency war against the people who live in the European continent. Europeans, actually, uh, those countries that do not belong to the European Union do, will suffer, like the Belarus starts because of the sharp devaluation of the Russian ruble down to 50 rubles per dollar. And we're saying this is a currency war. And there is zero. Uh, recognition of what's in the field, what's the play, what's the game, what's the rules. We're coming back to uh, Sherman's law uh, back from, from the 19th century, but we are still repeating the mistakes that are 130 years old now. And for 130 years old, we can next make, we cannot sort out this kind of misbehavior and this vicious circle. To implement a new welfare law or wealth law. 130 wealthy people in Budapest have no taxes for that whatsoever, but with they discussed these secret negotiations under secret negotiations somewhere in Luxembourg. Who's leading the European Commission? Juncker? Have you heard this last name? This is the guy being the Prime Minister of Luxembourg had secret negotiations with Corps to invest, to involve more money to Luxembourg. And with his other hand, he was fighting against the tax competition, having taken the track of the main European commissioner on behalf of the European Union. What, what, is, what is this guy going to do? What do you think? Then, will he make a proper taxation system? No, formally, they want to suppress offshore and uh, uh, safe havens. They are breaking down the Maastricht criteria. Two out of 28 EU member states violate their own legislation. So what's that? Is that the European standard or this is the European norm to apply the law? 22 countries, EU member states, has made it fashionable to break down the law, to actually violate it. So friends, let's be like in Europe. Let's do it the way they do it. But you can learn from your own experience. Let's not violate what they violate already. And let's analyze what is now being discussed in Ukraine. Let's, I have zero minutes left, but I'm coming to the end, which is uh, actually my conclusion. Uh, and this is in line with what Tom Palmer already said and what Andrei Vilarionov said. This is a verdict of the Pope that he made in the European Parliament. And you can see that the words are very painful and very um, actually painful for some of the European. Europe seems to be 
an old lady. This is a diagnosis. Its dignity, I absolutely agree with Tom, is what has to be at the center of the economic policies. Dignity does not make the center of any economy. We're not saying straightforward about the Pope, but it's important to realize and underline that when a person is brought from birth to death based on this policy, in this immoral, inefficient policy, this leads to degradation. So this is a Euro European Union like a f football field. It can be an example like the World Cup in Germany, or it can be as disgusting as the World Cup in Belarus. I don't know uh, about the Ukrainian progress in terms of football, but in Belarus, this is total crap. So as you can see, it seems to be look nice, and some some kind of ideas are there. Certain aesthetics are there, but it's not. The, you you need a different horse here in Ukraine. You need a normal locomotive. And in the context, who we are actually to answer to that question on the formal background, how many things have uh, their photos in uh, uh, Facebook or schoolmates, the Russian network? social media. Raise your hand if you have 100,000 likes on your Facebook for any publication. Nobody. And this is our approach to intellectual product and our reforms we're proposing. So we cannot be wise enough and apply anything like that. When we start trying to be smart, pretend we're smart, and we realize that the people that is our target audience is not always on Facebook. They're somewhere else. Glass of vodka, part of meat, piece of meat, piece of lard, whatever it is. If we want our reform to be successful, we need to take all these things into attention. Thank you very much indeed. We have a Q&A time. Please raise your hand, introduce yourself, and please speak on the microphone, otherwise you're not going to be translated. Hang on a minute. You'll be brought a microphone. I heard that in the East, li the word liberal uh, means socialist. How come? This is normally in the United States that's happening. Semantic revolution already has happened. So this is a problem of uh, wordplay and word technology. Do not argue with concepts and definitions, but let's take disaggregated offers and proposals and arguments regarding the thing, the fact. The narrower the question is, the better understanding there is. So otherwise, you're going to argue theoretically. You're going to waste time. You're going to spend your effort and energy. And who's going to be guilty? Is Obama guilty for a liberal being treated like socialist, or this is about the generation of Americans? So this is libertarian issue. If you ask a Ukrainian how he or she treats, treats a libertarian. Everybody will recognize re libertines or recall re libertines. Are you libertines? No, you're diligent people respecting yourself, families, and business. S some people are re libertines, but this is their own business. I offer not to argue on the concepts because they change, but the most important thing is to win the battle and make our own opinion about the necessary reform for Ukraine. Please introduce yourself. Daria, at the beginning you said that you are supporting the European choice. However, in the presentation you've shown a, a not very pleasant reality. And what's attracting you there in this choice? Charter of Free Liberty that Tom Palmer admitted, I'm attracted by such a Europe which has been historically built and became this, has become this civilizational center, open competition, civilized trade, independent courts. If the state was doing that without interfering with the economic processes, production and investment, there would have been a different Europe. So I'm all for this Europe. I want the European Renaissance uh, based on European values like it was done in the United States. It would have been a lot easier for us if Europe and the United States were different. We cannot change them right now. Roughly saying when the, the, the targets are shifting, right now we end up in a situation when I, this is my subjective forecast, 
in two years, uh, the, the world will survive global depression. A global depression will actually eliminate all the markets, all the targets, actually. And what's going to happen after that is it's going to be tens or dozens of local wars, degradation and liquidation of civilizations, as was written by Spengler. Or oh, it's going to be a renaissance of the world based on the values and principles that have, have proven to be lively and livable. It's going to be a different example. There can be no America, no Europe, no Ukraine, no Russia. 35 different civilizations uh, were disappearing from the surface of Earth. If people are going to be stupid enough not to take care of their security and security of land, they can destroy it, actually. Dinosaurs will show up again, and then it's going to be a different story. So I would like these values to be clearly fixed and put into the documents and policies of the Ukrainian politicians and civil society organizations for them to follow it. Good afternoon, Yaroslav. My name is Elizabeth. I would like to ask a question about uh, what you've said, that there are very few specialists uh, who are good experts in economy. Do we need additional economic training for, like, elementary training since the first years at school? And what kind of experts would you actually suggest to learn from? Do you mean for schools? No, just to be as wise as you are and to be as smart as you are, to just strive for it anyway. Well, it was quite a discouraging uh, answer from Andrei Ilarionov. Kaha was never asked and approached and challenged by anyone. When he was showing the swimming pool, when we were swimming together with Kaha, we were discussing proxyology, catalactic issues, these very smart things that actually boys your brain. But in the world, there is a group of people who have enough capacity and knowledge at the highest, highest level who offered suggestions, decisions, and their laws and rules are different. Personally, in 2005, I developed 12 different blocks for reform when there was a window of opportunity after the Orange Revolution on tax, privatization, budget, social aid. Nobody ever had any demand for it. The problem is that the revolution of dignity was made for what? By yourself. Because you wanted a different economic policy. At the end of the day, it turns out to that you have changed the top level. However, the economic policies still remain at the level of Kiev State University or Kiev Mohila Academy. The economic theory has very little economic significance. So some, how many people in this room who sooner or later uh, learned business professionally? Can you see, what do you think, what kind of impact of Mises for the economic brain on the bigger side, on your compatriots from Lviv, for instance? What's most discouraging for myself here, this guy was born there in Lviv, in the west of Ukraine. I uh, took a picture next to the shield where he was born, Childe. And most of the people do not even care or ignorant to that information that this guy was born in Lviv. But anything you ask about who's Mrs., you ask an Austrian or Hayek. Hayek maybe they know, but these last names is something like coming from space for them. This is some Chinese totally for them. So these last names that you can learn from, Tom, learn from Tom Palmer, Harbeler, Hilsner, Maklach, and many other guys. Go to Mrs.org or Kata.org, LibertyBelarus.org. There are so many different websites there in the web, on the web. And there is a very accessible and appropriate language for schools, for politicians, for experts when there is a dialogue. One thing is an academic dialogue uh, that Atlas is doing. And there's Institute of Humane Studies who has very smart experts. There is practical policies, Katana University or institute. Uh, there is foundations for economic education. In Ukraine, I hope there's going to be a think tank which will actually put together all these very wise ideas into something uniform, very powerful analytical organization. Because we are now asking ourselves why Ukraine still does not have any think tank like that, any powerful one. In Russia, there is Andrea Lariona in Belarus. We are doing that with the other guys for a long time. In Poland, there is one. Also in Italy, Germany. Why isn't there one in Ukraine? And the question is to you, because it seems that you have very strong link between commercial issues and what is called politics. 
if you want any valuable alternative for Ukraine, you then said, okay, uh, our oligarchs going to give money, will Kolomoisky give us some money, or Circus, or whatever oligarch tycoon you mentioned, or Fritas, will he provide funds, or Novichkin, whatever, whatever you mean. If you put the question like this, you will never get rid of this vicious circle. So there are ideas, of course, and we need to have them integrated. And for me, a good indicator that Ukraine is starting to get better is at least when Yatsenyuk, the prime ministers and the president's advisors are different. I mean, for these people, at least, otherwise Ukraine will follow this vicious circle that uh, Kaka was talking about, and, and even deeper, maybe. Here is a question. Silon <clears throat> Tarnenko, uh, there's the following question. You said in two years there's going to be a peace and depression. And my opinion is that we had a golden equivalent. I mean, a golden standard, yeah. Now we have a dollar standard in the world. It's just a paper. And what is the next standard in the future? What will be the most valuable thing on Earth in uh, the next five years? To, in order to uh, answer this question, I have to talk to you the whole day. Brain is the mo and soul is the most valuable thing on Earth, and it's been, it still is. If you, I mean, if everything else disappears, if you still have your brain and you have the ability to produce services, well, you will, you will rise. This is the most serious the currency. You have to invest in this, in your soul, in your, uh, <clears throat> in your brain and in your family. So. Paper, money, you know, there's a dollar and it's a hryvna. What paper do you prefer? We can criticize dollars and euros. You have to understand that Belarusian ruble and Ukrainian hryvna and Polish zloty are just papers. And Andrew Larion, I've showed you papers from the conference, and I had a speech that is called Gold Standard for Russia. It was a chance. <clears throat> and I would just introduce multi-currency since uh, January the 1st, because what the National Bank is doing with your money is just easy, it's hard to describe. Mul multiple currencies, good thing for you, you will be able to choose the currency what is most safe for you. and let people emit their own private money according to the standard they think is necessary. And I uh, support the golden standard theoretically and practically, but you need to understand the transition period between yesterday and future. Golden standards as a matter of private organization is not a matter of the central bank. So I want to emphasize on the humanitarian policy conference by Cotton Institute. They discussed the question of how to create this transition period, but the system is dead and we don't know about that yet because we don't know a global uh, decrease in our attitude to dollar. And then this will happen when the inflation will rise 20, 30 percent. And if the reserve system is, when it's had, had enough, this will, won't stop. And when the dollar will be more expensive the, than euro, and what will happen, happen next? It's still a question, and uh, it will affect us more than American and Germans if they have for dropping down from 45 to 25. But in Ukraine or Belarus, 
we will do will drop from 600 to 500 and uh, maybe even worse in Ukraine. But speaking about multiple currency, you talked about the system of uh, private money, right? Yeah. You have to describe better, but today in order to make private money work, you have to legalize dollars, euros, and other currencies in the territory of Ukraine so that a person could choose what currently they are working and paying taxes. But of course, you have to stop the Ukraine emission. If this is a competition, if people see that the central bank is still messing with Hrivnes, Hrivnes will lose its popularity and people will refuse Hrivnes. It will be a choice, people's choice, and it will discipline the central bank and the mechanism proposed by CAHA. I really support, then you have to limit it. If you if the inflation is more than 2%, the head of the central bank retires. I mean, I have to follow it. You can choose your own question. OK. Hello. My name is Irina. You raised a very interesting question of the VAT. And uh, is it possible to to refuse to to give up this con connection. Yes, it's a tax that is not practically or theoretically effective. And I estimated the tax system based on three taxes. And refusing the VAT and uh, Profit tax for corporation are two absolutely necessary taxes, and it will allow to decrease corruption and administrative costs and fines, and there will be more, the business will be more uh, clear. And it's interesting, two years ago I was asked by people from the Russian government to give theoretical groundings on uh, Russia's refusing from the VAT. And I've been studying that for 15 years, but in Ukraine it's still driven by lobbyists of this fiscal regime. We have a time for one short question. This, yeah. Yes, please. If you, your question is short, I will provide a short answer. My name is Bogdan, and my question is about thesis that we we have a depression in two years. Let's talk about Ukraine. Don't you think that this depression can kill all globalization? We had 1913, and then we had 60 years living no, no one knows where. Remember, I said the war is already there. Ukraine is under aggression, which is evident, but maybe it's even worse because if the defragmentation has already began, the WTO is just a paper. Just imagine if you take Putin to court against Ukraine, he will just laugh in your face and he will say they started it. And we faced the absolute ineffectiveness of European institutions, starting from the UN and ending with WTO and World Bank. When, when this money go to Ireland, it's just too much for me. We should just close this organization. And uh, the lady, your question, in very short answer as well. Thank you. Anastasia, also Ukraine. Well, on one of your slides before, <clears throat> what should we communicate to people? That it's still going on step by step, and we have a huge problem in Ukraine when people are waiting for the changes, and they say the 
it's another parliament and another revolutions where are the changes the curve is falling what do you think what method or idea you, we should use to prove to people that economy it takes time for economy to change Georgia is still a great example of uh, open dialogue with people on specific examples. There are lots of economic indicators that show that there is a progress. There are business surveys that document changes. And this, these are the best indicators that the government has really decided to change their economy. And neither Poroshenko nor Yatsenyuk will do that. If you paid 50% of tax and you, you used to pay 15, now you're f paying 5. And the Ukrainian government can't tell you these simple things because they are doing everything except economical reforms. Such reforms you have very quick results and you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't expect that in two years Ukraine will become a prosperous country, but it's possible to stabilize economical institutions in two years. <coughs> and Ms. Yatsik Balsarovich said that reforms can give you results in one year, and if you had these simple decisions on their currency regulations and tax, I'm sure you have millions of people that are in business. They would say, yes, this is very effective. You should follow this. But what is so forbidden in Europe about this product? You can go the European way, and then in order to sell uh, pork fat, you have to get lots of certificate when your uh, national product will go very expensive and you should be aware with libertarianism and Austrian your economic theory and your country will reach success thanks for attention thank you Yaroslav